And back in the 80s and 90s, when people were just making these linear population projections, they were not taking into account this rapid urbanization rate at the same time. And so our forecast for the world population has dropped drastically to around this 10 billion mark. And that is basically the new consensus. So just imagine in the last 20 years, we've corrected our estimate of the peak world population by 5 billion. That's a really, really large number to have been off by. And that obviously has very significant consequences because you stop thinking of overpopulation as a global problem and you think of it as an African problem or an Indian problem, which is in fact what it is. And you stop thinking about things in terms of peak oil and peak resources and more in terms of, you know, we can get there, we can do it, we can use natural gas, we can use better fertilizers, we can use more efficient irrigation, we can use GMOs, we can feed the world. You start to realize that maybe the abundance argument is more compelling than the planetary boundaries argument. Now, there are a lot of things that have to go right for us to achieve a rosy scenario, even for a world of only 10 billion people. But things seem much less dire in the sense of our capability to do so today than 10 or 15 years ago. Welcome to Fringe FM, the podcast that explores the edges of human understanding and looks at the technologies, trends, and societal norms shaping our collective future. Here, the world's top minds share their insights and predictions on the convergence, direction, and ethics of exponential technologies transforming life as we know it. You can learn more and stay up to date at fringe.fm. We're living in a golden era of connectivity, with the world changing faster than anyone can anticipate. Today's guest, Parag Khanna, is a leading global strategist, world traveler, and best-selling author. He's a CNN Global Contributor and the Senior Research Fellow at the Center on Asia and Globalization at Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. I apologize for any terrible pronunciation, but it's incredibly important that we jump into this. He's a managing partner of Hybrid Reality, a geostrategic advisory firm, authored and co-authored numerous books on the interconnectivity of humanity and on the future of global civilizations and the second coming of world empires. Prague was named one of Esquire's top 75 most influential people of the 21st century, featured in Wire Magazine's Smart List, and holds a PhD from the London School of Economics. In today's episode, we discuss why Asia is where the 21st century will unfold, how economic forces are driving apparently separatist movements, the devolution of nation-states and the rise of megacities, why borders are becoming increasingly less relevant, how Parag sees blockchain technology impacting politics, why local democracies are the most effective governing systems to date, and how cities are starting to challenge the power of government. Without further ado, I give you Parag Khanna. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. This was one of my favorite road trips uh, of the many that I've had, uh, was driving across Western China in uh, the year 2006. And what's notable about that date is that's before the Summer Olympics that China hosted in 2008, when things after which it became more difficult for tourists to access Western China. And the large scale development in Western China in terms of the infrastructure and really sort of subduing and integrating these large provinces of Tibet and Xinjiang really move forward. So it was a lot easier to move around back then. And I got a permit and a jeep and I drove all across Tibet and Xinjiang over these high passes and the Tibetan uh, mountain you know, sort of plateau and mountains. And it was just amazing to witness the sort of unspoiled Western China, which is such a rugged frontier, sort of like America's Wild West, but before there was any real development. And really, you'll never get that back. You'll never be able to see that part of China, which is two thirds of China, by the way. You'll never really get to see it in the same way again, the way I uh, got to experience it. So it was really just an incredible memory for me. And some of the landscapes are as just magnificent as anywhere on Earth. But people outside of China, and even many people within China, have never even heard of some of these places, let alone been there. So it kind of st- sticks out for me as a, as a memory, uh, you know, from my, from my earlier travels about 10, 15 years ago. And how did that bring you to today, seeing that development of China? Well, you know, a lot of my books and writing have been about geopolitics and geopolitical strategy. And, you know, going back to the 19th century, there's a concept that has really been the obsession of a lot of geopolitical strategic thinkers, and that is what's called the heartland. And the heartland in that parlance of the 19th century refers to Central Asia. There isn't a clearly defined set of countries. It's really a zone that spans Western China, the former Soviet republics, southern Siberia, this very strategic um, realm that is very difficult to, that cannot be mastered by sea power, 
and historically has been difficult for any one empire to control because of its vastness. And there's a theory, again, going back you know, hundreds of years, that controlling this heartland territory of the Eurasian supercontinent really is the key to being a global power. So it's not just in China, but also in, um, in Mongolia, in Russia, in Kazakhstan, in all of these countries that I've spent so much time over the last 20 years, where I've been studying the kind of heartland from all of these uh, different perspectives. But more importantly, there's only so much you can read about it, but just living it, breathing it, tasting it. You know, to me, so many of my favorite trips revolve around my research in that part of the world. And so I just keep on and on coming back to it. I was literally in Kazakhstan uh, five days ago again. You know, I go to Mongolia for fun and for work. I just am, am just obsessed. I think I was born with this obsession with that region, maybe from reading books about the Mongol Empire when I was a kid, whatever the case may be. But, so, you know, my everything I've written to this day in some way, shape or form kind of is a gravitational pull from this heartland region. Why do you think you've been drawn to that region and where's the power stem from? Well, it's interesting. I mean, you know, I was born in India. Uh, my family has a heritage, certainly in Central Asia. I even did one of those National Geographic genotyped uh, cheek swabs and got my DNA read. And it turns out I have, you know, Mediterranean, Greek, and Northern European heritage, which means that I stem from some combination of, um, you know, Indo-Aryan invaders and Alexander the Great. And, you know, it's, it's I, growing up in the places I did uh, in the Middle East, in New York, in Germany, no one ever thought that I was actually from the place I'm from. People thought I'd be like Moroccan or Mexican or, or Iranian, but never just like a plain, simple Punjabi guy from India. And so there's, I, I know that I'm sort of you know, of that soil in some weird sort of way. You know, so I studied the history, I studied a bit of the languages, certainly studied the culture. And then, of course, again, it's, it's been so geopolitically significant in history. So all of those forces kind of collide in my mind and, again, just sort of keep on drawing me to the region has been so significant and is becoming again so significant. It seems we're entering an era, Chinese dynasties have dominated much of history. We may be moving towards an era where that is once again the case. I'd like to get your read on how the how the world's progressing. It's a great question. I mean, my thinking has evolved from my first book to my next book. Uh, my first book was 10 years ago. It was called The Second World Empires and Influence in the New Global Order. And one of those empires was China. And that was the reason why I was traveling Western China, was researching that book. And I put China very front and center in that book, as, as uh, you know, scholars have been doing for at least uh, 15 years or so. So there wasn't anything necessarily novel about that. What's evolved now over the last 10 years is that I've started to think more about Asia as a much larger system. And China is a part of that system. China is the dominant part of that system. It contributes to the system. But Asia also shapes China. We primarily think of China doing whatever it wants, getting away with whatever it wants, you know, bullying and muscling, buying and bribing, you know. But in fact, there's many ways, now that I live in Asia, and I'm speaking to you from, from Singapore, I see all the ways in which the world shapes China, and Asians shape China, and how China doesn't always get what it wants. So I'm actually writing my next book about this Asian space that actually, you know, geographically, geologically, stretches from Saudi Arabia to Japan. That is the proper Asia. Now, very often when you say Asia, people just think China, Japan, and Korea. But in fact, Asia literally encompasses most of the Arabs, all of the Indians, Pakistanis, Central Asians, even Russia and Turkey are largely Asian countries. So I'm trying to recover that definition of Asia. And you think of Asia in that grand geographic sense, and it is, of course, the largest and most populous region of the world, you start to realize that it's not all about China all the time. And so I'm, um, you know, I'm going to finish this book. It's coming out next year. And it's going to point to not how the future is China, but certainly how the future is Asian. And, um, and that, I think, is where the world is definitely going. Asianization is a trend in the 21st century. And if you really go back in time and think about it from this kind of long point, long term point of view, the 19th century was when the world was Europeanized. The 20th century was when the world was Americanized. In the 21st century, I'm seeing this Asianization all over the world. That includes what China is doing, but it's also what India is doing, what Arabs are doing, and so on and so on. So that's what the book is about. And greater than 50% of the world population is in Asia now, isn't it? Or very close to? Very much so. And also, not only is that true, but, but for the rest of our lives and our grandchildren's lives, that will be true because the world population is actually peaking relatively soon within the next generation. We might reach 10 billion people, but probably not even 10 billion people. So at no point in the entire future of humanity, so long as we shall exist, will there be more than 10 billion people in the world. And therefore, most of the world population will, in fact, be Asian. I've learned a lesson. Never say never. You never know what will happen, especially as humanity starts to expand inter interplanetary. But it's interesting. So 10 billion people. Where does that number come from? And where, what are the implications as we do continue to grow? 
You know, it's a, it's a great question because it's been a very contentious topic. And one of the areas of mega trend research that um, we have as a community of what, you know, experts, scholars, whatever, have been way off base on is demographic project projections. If you go back to the 1990s, people as recently as then were forecasting a world of 15 billion people, a world of major uh, Malthusian crises of overpopulation and food scarcity and resource stress and peak oil and so on and so on. But a lot of there were some methodological errors and oversights there. One of the major things that we failed to account for was urbanization. The more rapidly you know people move to cities, the less children they have. And back in the 80s and 90s, when people were just making these linear population projections, they were not taking into account this rapid urbanization rate at the same time. And so our forecast for the world population has dropped drastically to around this 10 billion mark. And that is basically the new consensus. So just imagine in the last 20 years, we've corrected our estimate of the peak world population by 5 billion. That's a really, really large number to have been off by. And that obviously has very significant consequences because you stop thinking of overpopulation as a global problem and you think of it as an African problem or an Indian problem, which is in fact what it is. And you stop thinking about things in terms of peak oil and peak resources and more in terms of, you know, we can get there, we can do it, we can use natural gas, we can use better fertilizers, we can use more efficient irrigation, we can use GMOs, we can feed the world. You start to realize that maybe the abundance argument is more compelling than the planetary boundaries argument. Now, there are a lot of things that have to go right for us to achieve a rosy scenario, even for a world of only 10 billion people. But things seem much less dire in the sense of our capability to do so today than 10 or 15 years ago. There are technologies that we are deploying today in so many of these key areas, whether it's um, you know, large-scale solar power whose cost is now cheaper than that of gas uh, or oil, uh, many other things that we weren't really even doing so long ago. So I think even from the medium-term horizon standpoint, you can have a much more positive outlook about the future based on just changing your demographic forecast. And that's a big part of this podcast because the future is always scary and terrible and Hollywoodized because that's what sells. Fear sells. It's exciting. And I wanted to bring a much more realistic perspective to where we are headed and where we can be going. In terms of your research, where are the where are the top cities, countries, et cetera, where you see developmental change happening and the ones that are creating the best models for others to emulate as we go forward? Well, you know, it's, it's a very controversial kind of sort of question because, you know, obviously not everyone wants to end up in the same place, right? We have different aspirations and ambitions. Some countries will just want economic growth, right? But now we have a whole community of people and societies that are saying, you know, economic growth is not everything. We want inclusiveness. We want sustainability. We want happiness, whatever the case may be. So you have a lot of competing indices and rankings and measurements and policies to back up, uh, you know, whatever direction you or your society wants to go in. You know, I have a personal view that, that sustainable urbanization is obviously a globally necessary trend. We need to, the world is urbanizing quite irrevocably, quite organically, and therefore, you know, we need to make sure that our cities are sustainable, and that's going to have a big impact on our overall planetary condition. So I, I personally believe that sustainable cities, you know, are, are really the key, and that people should be watching and learning what smart cities do to be the most sustainable while also being you know, productive and dynamic and so forth. So when I look for role models uh, in terms of your question, I look for those sorts of places. So I live in one such place, place now, uh, Singapore. Uh, there's cities in Korea that are doing this, you know, all over the world, Barcelona, Berlin. You know, there are plenty of cities where you're seeing bits and pieces of the solution towards how to, how to sustainably urbanize. And I very, again, optimistic that I see all of the lessons from one city being transferred and learned uh, by the others. And I think that's a whole new kind of, uh, well, rather an ancient kind of, uh, of diplomacy, which is knowledge sharing between cities. It's been going on for thousands of years. But now I would put it front and center as the most important kind of diplomacy in the world today. Well, all is well and good for cities and countries that are doing reasonably well, but for countries that are trying to catch up. So for instance, China for quite a long time didn't care about pollution, emissions, or human rights to any significant extent to be able to catch up. What do we do as countries that are trying to catch up and catch up to this Western standard of living, try to accelerate in possibly unsustainable ways? Right. Well, you know, developing countries themselves had used to long defend the view that they are entitled economically to uh, develop and modernize through the same industrial uh, sort of arc that Western society did, and that that is a very resource intensive process, and that the West should not be pulling the ladder up from behind it as it's climbed up into wealth and modernity. But now we've crossed this sort of technological frontier where it's cheaper to use solar power, biomass, and other kinds of resources, nuclear power, 
to power our industrial development and modernization. So developing countries like China and India aren't really saying anymore that, oh, well, we have to send a lot more money to do the same thing. I mean, that's quite a silly argument. And again, it's one of exactly these things, just going back to what we were discussing a couple minutes ago in terms of the world population, where we weren't using the logic of the technological capabilities and abundance 10 years ago of national diplomacy that we are today, precisely because now even the poorest countries in the world have an opportunity not to be left behind, not to have to uh, climb up the ladder in a resource-intensive way, but instead we're talk talking about leapfrogging, right? They can do all the same things faster, cheaper, and better, and more sustainably today than we did 100 years ago. So again, I think the smart countries, rich or poor, already realize this. That's why we see China imposing such tight regulations on um, you know, demanding that electric cars sell more and more every single year, and regulating emissions, doing cap-and-trade systems, India doing so much more with solar power, biomass, nuclear, and so forth. So again, I see us being able to square this circle, and I see developing countries rather than being ideological laggards. You know, I'm not the first person to tell you that, in fact, the number of developing countries are taking the lead on these issues. Which is exactly what I wanted to ask you about. With the leapfrog, what are the possibilities that some of the world's powers or elite, specifically the U.S., start to get outpaced by other countries developing and otherwise? Well, so it's not about outpacing, right? It's really a marketplace. For example, I, I give, uh, just to, to come straight to examples that illustrate the point, Russia and China are two countries, the two largest countries on earth, by the way, so they're quite significant. They benefit from climate change, right? Because they, most of their geography is this frozen tundra. But now as temperatures rise in the northern latitudes, they suddenly become bread baskets. And I've been actually, uh, not because I'm a, a nerd, but for my, for my books, I've been looking at the, um, the annual wheat output of Russia and, uh, and Canada as well. And it's going through the roof. So suddenly, you know, frozen Siberia becomes a, a very important source of, um, of grain for, for the world. For other parts of the world that are experiencing drought and dry belts, like Middle Eastern countries, for example. I just want to hammer home what Parag is saying here. We all know that the cigarette companies put out study after study on the effects of cigarette smoking, showing that, oh, it does not actually affect health or longevity in any way, shape, or form. Sugar companies are doing the same today on the impacts of overconsumption and obesity due to sugar. When people have misaligned incentives, the information and actions are often not what we would hope for. So not everyone, in other words, is on the same kind of, um, you know, sort of emotive or, or uh, progressive, intellectually guided diplomatic arc towards this race to um, you know, develop the cleanest technologies. Because some countries, you know, uh, cannot dictate the system. I mean, their populations are small. So Canada and Russia, for example, are small populations. So they're not, and they don't have megacities. So they're not going to be able to unilaterally decide what global emissions are going to be. They're just going to be uh, what we would call, you know, uh, price takers, right? Um, they have to roll with punches, so to speak. They actually wind up benefiting in terms of their economies and the livability of their geography. So it's not a zero-sum competition, right? The key thing really is, can the countries like Germany and Spain that have achieved more or less grid parity, right? Grid parity means the cost of um, installing renewable power is actually uh, less than the revenue generated through, or through the utility savings, right? So, you know, can the, those countries that are so advanced share those technologies with those that are not there yet? And it's not a, a, a it's it's a race only in the sense that it's great for German companies and it's great for the planet, but it's a win-win kind of race. So I don't see it as zero sum. The U.S. obviously we could if we, there are certain things we it would be nice if we did do like just not burn coal or not sell our coal. Right now we're selling our coal to China to burn, even though China is trying gradually to, to phase out coal. So obviously we could all the planet would be better off if both the U.S. and China, as well as in fact uh, Germany and Poland and other countries that have a lot of coal, India too, were to simply not use it, right? So there's certain things like that that I would consider to be very positive, collective, smart steps. But generally speaking, it's not zero sum. It's really about reducing the cost of these technologies so that everyone simply use it as the obvious choice. What about the ideas around regulations and potential trading cap type system or other incentives? Essentially, when you have too many people, then the small incremental gains or losses from one individual don't impact. Uh, the Basically, people decide based off of their best interest versus the group best interest when it's not a significant change to themselves. Right. So, I mean, carbon markets, you know, have had their ups and downs, you know, at the national level. It may, you know, obviously the regulatory signal is important in general in terms of getting all states within a country or provinces or um, within a region like within the European Union 
it's a very important regulatory signal. It can, it has, of course, been abused at times in terms of countries simply just buying more credits to forestall their own actual reduction of, of national emissions. But then maybe there comes a point where everyone behaves and kicks in. Uh, you know, these things aren't universally proven to work. They're also very complicated. It's a bit of financial engineering, as you're also suggesting. So it's one way of going about it. But, you know, China was doing uh, a lot of these things around reducing its emissions unilaterally before it brought in things like, you know, carbon markets and so on. So I think that it's a, it's a, um, it's a component of the solution, but it's not the sort of, it's neither, it's neither entirely 100% necessary and it's certainly not sufficient in and of itself. Understood and completely agree. I want to shift now to mega cities and countries, nation states, and what, what we may be moving towards as the population increases and then possibly as we go interplanetary. How you see those dynamics and power changing? Okay, well, I guess uh, one thing, one step at a time. <laughs> uh, there's, uh, let's just start with the devolution, something that I work on a lot, something I've written about a lot. I, I see this devolutionary shift in terms of power decentralizing from federal governments and central authorities towards cities and provinces. And I see that happening all over the world. I even see it in authoritarian countries, um, like in China, where, of course, Beijing is uh, an all powerful capital and a vert vertically integrated state. But it's same time, it has 25, 26 megacity clusters that are so powerful economically that they have growing autonomy to sort of create their own policies, raise their own capital, you know, drawing their own investors and all of these sorts of things. So devolution is obviously happening in America. We've got cities like New York and LA and, you know, they're declared themselves sanctuary cities. They're saying we want to have our own immigration policy, our own climate policy. We're going to raise taxes and fund our new infrastructure. We want to share less with Washington and so forth. You've got in the UK, You've got the capital city of London disagreeing with the rest of the country on Brexit. So there's a lot of examples of this tension between the city and the central state, and that's all part of devolution. I see that as totally irrevocable. It's part and parcel of this world that's urbanizing and cities becoming more powerful. And cities simply connecting to each other directly and not needing their central government to do it for them. That's part of what's animating the Scottish independence movement and the Catalan independence movement in Spain, because these are very wealthy provinces of countries that are saying, you know, we're global. I know what you're thinking. You want Parag to jump into blockchain and decentralization. We'll get there, but not quite yet. And we'll jump into Parag's strong opinions on the subject. But now let's get back. The Scots invented the Industrial Revolution. And the Catalans have been traders and, and uh, you know, have their own language uh, for, for, for centuries. The Venetians and Italy as well. They, don't, they feel like they don't need their corrupt and, uh, well, poorly governed states uh, uh, that much. They may need them for national defense, but no one's declaring war on Scotland. So they are, they are often characterized as tribalist movements, but these are totally globalist people. They have been for centuries. So this is all part of devolution uh, as well, need to understand in that way. So, so to me, I think that's a good thing. I think that democracy to succeed really depends on, on being a local democracy, right? You need to actually have people with a voice over their local affairs. That is the origin of democracy, and that is also the future of democracy. And there is not a successful democracy that is not a local democracy. So I view that as a positively self-reinforcing kind of process, devolution and democracy going, going hand in hand in the future, and lots more sort of self-governing local entities. They could be huge entities. You know, Los Angeles is a huge place. New York, too. Uh, London as well. And they are part of larger entities, federations, you know, like uh, the United States, like the European Union. Uh, these things don't have to be antithetical. You know, but the whole combination of openness, devolution, connectedness pushes us to this world that, to me, is organized more around connectivity and less around borders. The borders don't go away, but we're, we're investing more resources in transcending the borders than we are in building the borders. What about in the Catalan movement, where specifically where one region is driving the majority of the economic growth and success of the country? You could say that about California and the U.S. You could say it about a lot of regions. These regions eventually in these cities are going to start to get the the EBGBs of, uh, we kind of got to get out of here because we're the only reason this is successful. Do you start to see political problems happening? Well, you know, we, we have started to see political problems happening. That, that's exactly why I've been uh, studying this so closely in these movements all over the world. And, and some of my maps in the technology will kind of isolate these um, and kind of, you know, depict these uh, devolutionary movements around the world, um, Africa, uh, Europe, uh, and so forth. And, um, you know, again, part of the driver of it is data. So the city, a city like Venice is looking exactly at its uh, intake from tourism into its coffers, into its revenues. And it's saying, oh, my God, we're paying five euros to Rome uh, for every three euro we get back. 
And God knows what Rome is doing with the money because they're certainly not building quality infrastructure. And now they're run by a bunch of, um, you know, well, I'm not, I don't have a polite term for the five star movement in Italy, so I won't say anything. But they're saying we are the Venetians, for God's sake. We are a great Middle Age and Renaissance empire, you know, with globe spanning tentacles. You know, we produce Marco Polo. And, you know, here we are trapped in this failing Southern European country. Get us out of here. So we're, we are seeing a lot of that. And a lot of it has to do with this very, very straightforward financial calculation around how much money they're able to bring in, how well they think they can spend it, and how poorly central governments are spending it. I mean, let's face it, there's no harm in me pointing out the truth that this is about money. It's much more about money than it is even about identity. Because we do know that Venetians and Italians can get along. We know that Catalans and Spanish people can get along, right? Even the Basque people have given up their separatist movement, and the Basques are a truly unique ethnic and linguistic community um, with very little history of, um, you know, sort of total integration within the Spanish state. So it's perfectly possible, right? But at the same time, when they look at the numbers, they're saying, well, actually, it doesn't make sense. So, uh, you know, we're going to see a lot more of this, more data we have available in real time about our fiscal spending and the circulation of money within and around states, you know, the more movements we'll have towards self-control. How do we move towards that peacefully in an era where governments have the exclusive right to violence? It's, it's a great question. It's, it's actually more of an academic question because we, we do think of the definition of the state as the, the political unit with the um, you know, legitimate monopoly over the use of force. But in, out in the real world, you know, most of the world, there's lots of shades of gray in that area in terms of um, you know, independent paramilitary uh, forces, constabulary, you know, police forces, you know, relatively or shared jurisdiction over certain kinds of military or police activity and so forth. And, you know, again, you, you, you saw to some degree in Catalan in, in, just in the last few months, violence in the streets. You did see the Spanish uh, police going out there with sort of, you know, rubber bullets or whatever, but it was, it was still relatively velvet glove. It wasn't like trying to crush a secessionist movement sparking a civil war. So we haven't seen too much of that crossing of the line. You know, we've had new countries being born with relative frequency, sometimes peacefully, sometimes not. Sometimes the violence occurs for a long time before the independence, like uh, East Timor, South Sudan. We, last year, we had Kurdistan declaring, effectively trying to declare independence, but that being shut down through a combination of uh, diplomatic and, and fiscal threats um, and military intimidation as well. So not every movement is going to you know, see the light of day. Some of them will sort of fall back into line. The Scots are not really agitating as much. The Quebec independence movement has more or less been sort of, sort of fizzled out to some degree. There isn't one right answer, but the fact is, and I think this is the kind of you know, headline number to come away with, the world only had 51 countries when the United Nations was founded, and today it has 200. So I want you to tell me that you are going to put the genie back in the bottle. You know, I want you to tell me that you're the all-powerful army that believes that, there is, that you can freeze the map of the world in time, because clearly the last 70 years of history will prove you wrong. Now, that's not to say that I think, uh, you know, Texas is going to become independent. It's not to say that I think, you know, the Palestinians, the Kurds and others, they may never get their own country. So every every situation I found, you know, the, the, the more closely I've studied it, obviously, over the years, the less one can find one right answer. One can only see patterns, the patterns that suggest that some country will absolutely become independent versus the patterns that suggest that actually there is a sufficient degree of accommodation that will keep the country together. I mean, look at India. India had 14 states uh, when it was when it became independent in 1947, today it has 30, right? So one of the arguments I make in India that obviously people don't like to hear is that what holds India together is uh, geology, not democracy, because you've got a peninsula sticking out in the ocean and you've got the Himalayan mountains kind of boxing you in. There's no place for these these would be states to go. They have achieved a lot more devolution, right? Again, you've doubled the number of states in the country, but the country itself hasn't fallen apart. But just imagine if India were sitting in the heart of Eurasia. And many of those states could build their own relations directly over land with their neighbors. How Indian would they be or feel or act at that point in time? And, you know, I think it's a very cruel statement to make, but I think it's, it is a counterfactual, obviously, to thought experiment. But I think it's a fairly compelling one. The fact is, again, that you cannot cheat people. And this is one of these you know, almost universal rules. You can't cheat people out of their own local knowledge. Right? You can't tell people what's best for them and have them believe it when their own daily lives speak to the contrary. And you see this, whether societies are rich or poor, educated or uneducated. This is a major problem today. As no one's listening to everyone else and we live in our filter bubbles of fake news, we create silos where it's incredibly challenging to have conversation. 
This is something that we, especially America, need to address to be able to overcome the upcoming instability caused by the political system as a whole. People understand their local circumstances better than you do. And I, and I, I personally advocate a very healthy respect for that. Uh, I, I do personally support a lot of these movements. Uh, I do get called in to go to talk to them. I don't necessarily think that they're all going to make it, you know, but I try and give them the best advice based on the circumstances they're in. Is this like the four minute mile? Once we broke it, suddenly we saw it being broken again and again and again because people realized it was possible? Well, in terms of the waves of decolonization, of course, right? In the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, you have said waves of countries across Africa, Asia being, uh, you know, sort of being, being born as a result of the collapse of the British and French empires. So certainly there, there was this spirit. You know, information traveled quickly then too. This sense of, you know, they did it, we can do it. And, uh, you know, let's get together and form new diplomatic communities to share lessons about how to be a successful independent country. So you saw Singapore, Sri Lanka, India, you know, Kenya, all of these countries, even Jamaica, you know, all of these post-colonial countries of the Commonwealth, you know, forming their own kinds of uh, uh, groups to learn from each other. And I think that sort of spirit carries on in various configurations uh, to, to this day. But I don't know about the sort of four minute mile analogy. I mean, I think to to kind of complete the thought from earlier, I, I actually don't think that we'll have more than 210, 220 sovereign countries in the world. I think that what happens is that more and more places, because of the force of connectivity, basically become sufficiently, they become satisfied with the, the state of affairs where they're super connected to everyone else in the world even if they're still technically part of a more powerful sovereign national state. And that's what, again, Scotland has agreed to and what, um, and what Venice still agrees to, uh, what the, what the Quebec's, what Quebec has agreed to and so forth. So again, some new countries will become independent. Others will say, it's okay, we'll just hang in there. I know you need to run really soon, Parag. I have two last questions. The first being blockchain and your thoughts around decentralization and what we're seeing in terms of governance, evolution, and testing and the potential implications. Sure. I mean, I think I think blockchain technology is certainly going to continue to fuel the devolutionary pattern, whether it's in, in business or actually in, in political life. Hey, Matt here. A quick aside. For those unfamiliar, blockchain is the underlying technology of Bitcoin, Ethereum, and many other cryptocurrency and crypto asset protocols. It's very similar to the way the internet functions in that it allows individual communication, but it cuts out the middlemen. Prague is going to do a much better job explaining this and the implications in a sec, but just wanted to have a quick primer. What happens with blockchain is you're basically uh, kind of like the internet itself. You're just reducing transaction costs. You know, you're radically reducing transaction costs between any two people, the ability to share information, creating a new platform for organization among entities, again, individuals, businesses, governments. So in, in doing so, and obviously adding a lot more transparency to those transactions, so you're taking away some of the barriers to, uh, to being a self-governing entity at low cost. And uh, therefore, I think it's an enabling technology, a radically enabling technology, and, and you know, in, in almost every respect, a very positive one. I can completely agree. I think we're moving towards a very interesting world. I want to thank you for coming on. My last question before I let you go, what is one topic you would like to see covered on Fringe FM and who would you like to hear speak about it? Oh, a topic I'd like to hear covered. I want to hear a lot more about sort of, you know, the, the genetic enhancement, bio enhancement, um, you know, longevity, life extension. Um, you know, are we getting there? Maybe I'm motivated by sort of feeling frail or something or, or a free midlife crisis. I don't know. But um, to me, it's, it's fascinating. And it's obviously a game changer in so many ways. One of the things that I'm kind of you know, looking at in, in, a, in, in sort of a more, you know, sort of a, at this point, superficial form is regulatory policies in different countries around genetic technology. And the lengths to which governments may be willing to go, I'm speculating maybe about this, in terms of enhancing their workforce and citizenry to have healthier, longer lives, to reduce healthcare costs and, and keep the economy going. So to me, uh, I don't know who the leading expert is at the intersection, because there are a lot of people on the scientific side who are knowledgeable about this, but I would love to hear from someone who's a techno-demographic economist to sort of put all the pieces together and speculate on what this is going to mean in the year, by the year 2030 or 2040 for our, um, for the sort of, let's call it an arms race, you know, genetic arms race between societies. I completely agree. We have a couple of very interesting guests along the longevity and uh, research side of things. And I think personally, the countries that ban this versus the countries that are more try it and let's see, the try it and let's see countries will build lots of power because this is going to be the next era of computing. The next era of change is happening genetically. And the the, the rich citizens of the world will flock to the places where they can live longer, better lives. 
Yeah, you know, I've, I've uh, sort of this punchline, I guess you could call it, that I uh, came up with a while ago is that the, the difference between success and failure in the future is not democracy versus authoritarian or rich versus poor. It's new stuff versus old stuff. And certainly it's the countries, societies that embrace the new stuff that are going to get ahead. As long as that new stuff doesn't wipe us all out. Parag, thanks for coming on the program. I know Good you've point. got to run. Where is the best place for thanks. people to reach out to you online? Thanks so much, Matt. Really, really appreciate the conversation. It was great to talk to you. Yeah, it was great talking. Where's the best place for people to say hey? Oh, uh, the best place to say uh, paragkhanna at gmail.com. So it's P-A-R-A-G-K-H-A-N-N-A. Or uh, just through my website as well. Uh, everything is uh, everything's out there. Awesome. We'll throw links and everything in the show notes, guys. Fringe.fm. And sorry about the, the audio quality cutting in and out a little bit, but thought it was a very valuable conversation we had to have. Thanks, Prague. Cool. It worked out just fine. Thank mm-hmm. you, Matt. Take care. Send Cheers. Send me up. If you want more of Fringe FM, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or go to Fringe.fm, where you'll find tons of audio and video interviews with leaders in the fields of genetics, cryptocurrency, longevity, AI, space, VR, and much, much more. And you can follow me on Twitter at It's Matt Ward. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a quick review in iTunes to help more people discover Fringe FM.